Morning, everyone. My name is Meng Chang. I'm the uh, Exec Vice President at Purdue University and the uh, John A. Everson Dean of College of Engineering. Uh, on behalf of many parts and organizations of this university and the Purdue Research Foundation, we'd like to extend a warm welcome to all of you here in person and those watching online. Now or later, to the first in the series of the Ambassador Distinguished Lecturers at Purdue. And we are honored and privileged today to uh, welcome Madame Ambassador Olaf Stauter and uh, Dr. Bruggen to be the inaugural speakers in this new series here. Uh, in particular, we are absolutely delighted that uh, Purdue University, the state of Indiana, are able to enjoy this growing relationship with uh, many enterprises and universities from Sweden and to welcome students here, to welcome business here, to welcome technology and economic development along with research collaboration here in the middle of this country. And we are committed to be part of this utterly important and increasingly stronger bond between the Kingdom of Sweden and the United States of America through technology. Madam Ambassador, welcome. So good morning. Oh, it's good morning, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for having us here. It's, it's uh, a true delight to leave Washington, D.C. Haven't done that for, for a long time now, so uh, good to see you all here. I hope you've been doing okay during these particularly uh, strange times, maybe to be a student uh, with COVID. Uh, so it's good to see you all back, back here. I hope you, I don't know if you studied at home or if you were here all the time, but if you were home all the time, I'm sure you're very happy to be in college. So this is a great honor, and actually, I will give you a small history lesson today. I don't know if you know very much about Sweden. I won't bore you with all our history from the Vikings and onwards, but talk a little bit about the fact, maybe it's strange, that a small country you can see us there uh, up north, where we are in the northern corner of, of, our, uh, of the map, uh, why a small country like Sweden uh, establishing a fighter jet trainer factory in Lafayette, Indiana. Well, it's a, it's a quite long story, actually. Uh, it starts in 1814, uh, but I will just tell you that the first Swedes actually arrived in the United States in 1638. We established a colony in Delaware, and if we hadn't been beaten by the Dutch in, uh, after 15 years, and they eventually by the Brits, maybe you would all have been speaking Swedish uh, at this time, but that's, that's not the case. Anyway, uh, but um, the Swedish uh, strong defense industry actually goes back to 1814. Uh, we then had to import a new king, uh, and because the dynasty that we had uh, was, uh, was kind of over, we had to, to get someone new. Uh, and then at the time they thought, mm, Napoleon, it would be good to have a French general as a Swedish king. So they imported uh, Marshal Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, um, who became crown prince at the time. So when he eventually inherited the throne in 1814, he realized his goal was to get Norway back from Denmark, because we had lost Norway, we had lost Finland, uh, and uh, he did not at all side with Napoleon. He sided with the French to get Norway back. And then he looked at his empire and thought, hmm, not so big, um, fairly big land, but not many people, very poor, because we had been at war for so many, many years. So he decided that the union between Sweden and, 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 and uh, Norway, we should become neutral. And he himself wanted to have an important role uh, in Europe as a mediator in all the wars. You know, there were constant wars at the time. Uh, so he wanted to be a prominent figure in Europe, mediating peace between different uh, actors. And so he thought it was good that Sweden then became neutral itself, because that would give him more credibility. 
And I think in Sweden, at least, uh, Sweden is not a member of NATO. Uh, we didn't join after the Second World War. Uh, many think that we are, uh, are uh, by default, bunny huggers and peaceniks. That's not the case. So uh, the, the reason for him to do this was actually to give himself a prominent role, and we were so poor. This uh, poverty that we had actually led to that one-fourth of our population, or one-third even, left for the United States in between 1850s and onwards. So at the year 1900, Chicago was the second biggest Swedish city after Stockholm. And uh, we have uh, played quite a big role in the development of these country skyscrapers of Chicago, for instance, where it started to be built by Swedes. Uh, several uh, household companies here in the U.S. are... Swedish Walgreens, for instance, Greyhound, uh, Carlson, Wagon Lee, the travel company, and others are, are Swedish. But anyway, so one-fourth of our population left because of poverty, religious persecution, and inequality. And of course, uh, that eventually led to uh, the creation of the Swedish welfare state that we know today, because of course the politicians at the time panicked. One-fourth of the one-third of the population left. Uh, they had to institute schooling for everyone since the 1860s. Uh, that, and then we had some great innovations, late 1800s, like Ericsson, for instance, telephone company, uh, SKF, ball bearing company, which is also here in Indiana, and many other inventions. So we became a country of engineers. I think due to the fact that so many people left for America, they went, had, we had mandatory schooling from the 1860s, and then a strong engineering culture. Anyway, then, um, you know, it's all about location. So we have a very big uh, neighbor to the east. So uh, the neutrality that was then instituted in 1814 carried us through the First World War. We stayed outside of that. Of course, it was tough for, for Sweden as well at the time. Uh, same went for the Second World War. Uh, there we had a very tough balancing act to be neutral. Uh, we, uh, for instance, sold iron ore to, to the Germans during the war. But at the time, same time, we provided the, the Brits uh, with uh, uh, ball bearings, uh, as I said before, a uh, Swedish invention, uh, uh, air protection, military air protection from the Swedish industry. So we, we tried to play both sides. So um, then after the Second World War, uh, NATO came about and the Warsaw Pact. So the Cold War was a fact. Sweden decided, given our long history of neutrality, to try to stay, continue to stay neutral. Um, so we did not join NATO. Uh, we were, Finland had to, after the war, have a friendship, friendship pact <laughs> with the Soviet Union. Uh, so they were kind of left on their own uh, in, in the corner next to us. So uh, we then, uh, we decided, as I said, to be neutral, or militarily non-aligned. But to make this non-alignment trustworthy and believable, we got a huge military industry going. As I said, country of engineers. Uh, we had an air force already back in the 1920s. But after the war, our, our military industry really boomed. Uh, so since then, we have you know, uh, created our own fighter jet plane. Uh, we are usually competing with the US uh, on the international market. Uh, I can tell you that the US wins more often, even though we think we have just as good a plane for a decent amount of money. Uh, but uh, so uh, we also produce uh, our own submarines. Uh, I was just in Washington at the huge army fair, AUSA, uh, where you could see a lot of Swedish inventions uh, together with uh, BAE. We have uh, one of the biggest companies when it comes to, um, what do you call it, how you aim for with your weapons to, to reduce casualties. Uh, we have grenade launchers that are used by the U.S. Army and so on. So we're huge for being such a small uh, country. And the reason, as I said, why we did this, why we got this big industry, is to make our own neutrality credible and believable. So the most of the production during the Cold War was, were for the own, our own needs. We had a very strong army during the Cold War time. But then when the Soviet Union fell, and we all thought peace would come to Earth, <laughs> and we changed our, our, our uh, doct military doctrines, and we kind of not disassembled dis uh, uh, our uh, military, but we really scaled down, we started selling and exporting. 
And Saab, together with the, that have you know created the Gripen fighter jet, has been quite successful. And uh, now, as I said, we are opening a huge facility today uh, in Lafayette to produce uh, trainers fighter jets. So it's airplanes, but it's not the real combat ones, but it's the ones you use for training. So huge factory. Huge production and, of course, great for innovation. And I know uh, that uh, Saab, together with the University in Linköping, where they are located, will have a very strong tie to um, Purdue University. So that's another strong link. So for those of you who are interested in uh, aeronautics, uh, come and work in Linköping for a while. I think it would be great. And we also have, I think you have an exchange program with our, with our university there. So this is a long story of telling you why a small country in the north uh, that is kind of a peaceful, uh, trying to have a peaceful existence in, in a very tough area, uh, has a strong military industry that is actually going to Indiana. Today, we are increasing our defense spending quite a lot. Uh, we uh, see uh, Russia as an increasing threat uh, when it comes to military activities. We cannot anymore rule out a military attack uh, from Russia. We see a buildup of the Russian military forces. We see much more activity in the Baltic Sea, which you can see the ocean between, the water between Sweden and, and Finland and, and Russia. We see much more um, present activity there of Russian forces. Uh, annexation of Crimea in 2014 of course, uh, shows that Russia does not respect international law uh, and sovereignty of other countries. And um, we are quite worried about the situation in our vicinity. We are, of course, completely aware of the US focus on China. Uh, we share uh, that worry uh, about China. But of course, uh, we don't see a military threat from China in our area. But we do see that from Russia. So very much about my work, everyday work in, in Washington is you know, telling the story that I just told you. Why we need to co cooperate very closely with the United States. As I said, we're not a member of NATO. But we cooperate very closely with the United States when it comes to development of, of our military equipment, when it comes to military exercises. We have been in all NATO, even if we're not a member of NATO, we still have been in all um, NATO's military operations, taking part in Afghanistan alongside with American colleagues and so forth. So for us, it's paramount to our security that the US interest in Europe is still there and that you show up uh, at exercises, show the Russians that you, the transatlantic link and, and, and uh, the Article 5 in NATO is valid. Uh, so that's what I try to preach every day <laughs> in Washington. And I can assure you we have a very good cooperation. But given the shift of focus, which we completely understand towards Asia, and every government and every administration just has one bag of money. And when that has to be divided, uh, when it comes to your security, um, uh, we just want you to keep your interest in the Baltic Sea and in our region as well. So, so we, can, we can stay safe. Of course, uh, we don't only see military threats. A cyber hybrid is very much a reality. And uh, that's maybe where we are even more vulnerable. Uh, I'm sure you have take a notice of the ransomware attacks in your country. Washington DC was out of gasoline this summer because the ransomware attack on a pipeline from Texas. We just had an attack on uh, our, like our Safeway. So uh, 800 stores could not uh, sell food for a whole week, uh, quite serious. So that's also things we need to take more seriously. And I think you as students at this fantastical technical university have all the opportunities to also uh, get into those kind of technical issues. How do we protect ourselves from cyber attacks uh, in the future? Because maybe that's even more a, of a realistic threat to our societies than, uh, than an actual military threat. So uh, Sweden is not just a military superpower. We're also an innovative superpower. Actually, in the last ranking, we were number two, uh, the second most innovative country in the world after Switzerland. We are very proud of that. As I said, we're a country of engineers. Uh, we're we're uh, very innovative when it comes to all the new technologies that I've talked about. Stockholm is uh, second place in the world when it comes to unicorns uh, after Silicon Valley. So now it's my great pleasure to hand over to Maria Brobergs, who is the innovation counselor uh, at the embassy, to tell you a little bit more of what we are doing. So thank you so much for attention.
Thank you, Karin, and thank you, Purdue University, for inviting us. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I will broaden the scope from defense and uh, security to, uh, to sustainability in, in general, um, and inviting you all to uh, cooperation with Sweden in, in this area. Uh, we have just launched um, this uh, wording, Pioneer the Possible, to show that it's, I mean, sustainability and technology in, to advance sustainability, is, um, it's really here. So that's what I want to uh, invite you all to collaboration with Sweden. So let's pioneer the possible together. Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, goals, 17 goals that are due in uh, 2030, and it's only a bit more than eight years to go, and we are not, not on track with most of the goals. Uh, so we need to really speed up uh, what we are doing. Uh, climate change really needs to be tackled. Uh, Sweden has quite ambitious uh, climate targets, and we were really happy when the U.S. announced that you would rejoin the Paris Agreement. That's a really, uh, I mean, good, uh, it's a message to the world, that the, when the world's largest economy uh, really commits to this, it's, it's really powerful, and it mobilizes uh, efforts from everywhere. Uh, and I mean, you could say that these are only, I mean, the dates here, uh, carbon neutrality in uh, 2040 or 2050, it's just, it's targets, it's maybe just words. Uh, but I'm here to, to, I mean, to give some example on what's really happening in Sweden and also in global cooperation, because the green transition is really happening. Um, there are a lot of stuff going on. Uh, green batteries, for example. In the end of this year, um, the Swedish company Northvolt will have start uh, full-scale production uh, of uh, the world's greenest battery cells uh, in the north part of Sweden. And that's an area which is really booming with new companies in the area of technology. Uh, so these batteries, it will be lithium-ion batteries using renewable energy and also uh, in a closed loop uh, process where all the materials uh, will be recycled. So using recycled materials as input and then having this closed loop. And billions of dollars has been invested in this, uh, in this project. Uh, another uh, example is fossil free steel. Uh, we have now produced the first steel with uh, input of uh, hydrogen from renewable uh, electricity uh, producing steel without carbon emissions and that has been delivered to the Swedish company Volvo for producing uh, trucks uh, and this is called a hybrid project uh, so fossil free and also it says here fossil free from mine to steel and also the mining industry is making the shift towards uh, uh, pure electricity driven machines. Uh, with the help of, of engineers, of course. Uh, hybrid will have commercial scale production of fossil free or carbon free steel uh, from 2026. Now it's only a pilot plant so far. Uh, other new solutions are uh, uh, whatever you can make from wood. Uh, for example, you can make, I mean, of course, uh, uh, high rises uh, with wooden structures. Uh, the picture in, in the middle here, clothing. A new uh, factory in Sweden is starting now to produce uh, cellulose and textiles from, from wood. Uh, and of course, uh, airplane fuel can also be made from, from wood. Maybe Saab will, will run on that uh, in the future. Yeah, <laughs> thumbs up over there. Yeah, so a lot of things are really uh, going on. And also when it comes to technical innovations for human well-being, for, for quality of life, there are also many things uh, going on. And as Karin said, uh, we have a long tradition of engineers in Sweden, and we're really proud of that. For example, the marine propeller is a Swedish uh, invention, uh, invented in the, uh, by uh, John Ericsson in 1850. And this propeller was actually uh, used in the, 
uh, civil war uh, ship Monitor, uh, which uh, beated uh, the Confederate ship, uh, what's it called? Yeah, Merrimack. So it proved that it, it functioned. And Karin also mentioned the ball bearing, uh, which we are proud that uh, SKF, the Swedish company, invented in the early uh, 20th century. And now development of, of this technology is going on here at Purdue. And actually, uh, I heard that Purdue has produced uh, two and soon to be, we hope, three uh, PhD that is working at SKF with advance in this uh, technology. So great uh, cooperation there. Uh, more recent modern uh, inventions are, for example, Bluetooth, which is a Swedish uh, invention. Uh, the pacemaker, Skype, the free internet call service, is a, a Swedish uh, invention. Spotify, online music, streaming, uh, more modern and, and popular inventions. I guess you have heard of all of them. Uh, but this is, I mean, it's not uh, single individuals or um, single companies that drive this innovation. It's, it's cooperation. Of course, scientists. Uh, have a huge uh, part in this, uh, making the foundation and breaking new, I mean, pushing the frontier uh, of our knowledge. But there also is business leaders who are, have the courage to uh, invest and to uh, make these inventions into real innovation and put them on, on the market. And investors that, that are willing to, to risk their money in helping the, the uh, business leaders. In Sweden, we find that politicians have been really important in, in putting the long-term rules of the game in place. Uh, in Sweden, politicians were really early out uh, in establishing a carbon tax, uh, perhaps not, not so popular but every, uh, by everyone at the time, uh, but that has really showed that we want to reduce the use of fossil fuel. It's a carbon tax on, on the content of, of fossil fuels in energy. Uh, so that has ha had a, a crucial role in decreasing carbon dioxide emissions. And you see at, at the same time, uh, we have increased GDP quite a lot. So there is not, I mean, the economy did not suffer. And what was crucial here is this long-term direction, this is where we are going. That was also the reason why Sweden were one of the, I think we were the f first country to have this carbon ne neutrality goal, to set the direction for businesses uh, to, to minimize risk. And as Karin said, we're a really, really small country up in the north, only 0.13% of the world population. Uh, so we have always had to be open. Uh, we have, I mean, we're also depending on our exports. Uh, so that's sort of in our DNA. Uh, but although there, we're a very small country, we are proud to have 3% uh, of the world's top uh, 100 universities. So, uh, I mean, uh, far more than our sort of share uh, of the top universities. Uh, we have an innovative public sector. We have had this uh, triple helix cooperation between academia, the public sector, and business. That is really also something that defines Sweden, uh, which we value a lot. But of course, it's not only Sweden. We cannot, I mean, we, we cannot meet the sustainability goals ourselves. Uh, so it's also a lot about cooperation. And we already mentioned the ball bearing several times. It is just a... I mean, it, it may seem like a small, uh, small example, but what the ball bearings have done for the world is actually huge in saving costs and fossil fuels. So those, I mean, give us a handful of those uh, inventions, and I mean, it makes a difference. Uh, so I would like to invite you all to connect with us. Uh, and uh, join us in the co-creation of a more sustainable society and technology to assist on, on that journey. Uh, so just, uh, I mean, you could come to Sweden and study as an international student. There are many different, I mean, 
we have a lot of different universities, and you can do a short period of time, or you, you can stay longer. And there are uh, information at studyinsweden.se, for example. Uh, if you are um, a more senior researcher, a, a doctoral student, or or a senior researcher, there are also a lot of uh, opportunities, uh, grants. And we have this uh, foundation, Swedish Foundation for International Cooperation in Research and Higher Education. Uh, that can guide you, for example, if you're interested. Uh, my last uh, invitation, I mean, I invite you all, of course, to cooperate with Sweden. Uh, a specific um, event that we will host is uh, in connection to the World Expo in Dubai. Uh, we will host a virtual innovation event, a four-day uh, Sweden Innovation Day uh, days event. Uh, to cooperate on uh, co-creating uh, sustainable solutions. And I just picked two. There will be four different sessions. So I picked two here, missions to achieve the global goals and co-creation for innovation, which is more about how we innovate, if we can innovate the way, uh, way we innovate. So uh, you're all very welcome to uh, join us in this uh, journey to, uh, to pioneer the possible, and I hope I... I was able to share some, some of the inspiration. I'm really inspired to, to be here. I will have a lot of, of interesting meetings during the rest of the day. I'm really looking forward to that. And thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, you are well, well, welcome to, to contact me. Uh, I work at the Swedish Embassy in Washington, D.C. as a science and innovation counselor. So please, if you have any uh, questions, you're welcome. Thank you. Industry for sorry. Um, what do you see as the biggest industry going forward with cooperation on a technological level between the U.S. and Sweden? Thank you. We see a lot of Swedish investments here, a lot of startups coming over to the U.S. Uh, many of them do the mistake of going to New York and Silicon Valley uh, first and realize it's too expensive, but that's a big part. We are creating lots of jobs with Saab here, for instance, uh, technology-wise. Ericsson is uh, putting a huge, Ericsson, you know, the, it's Swedish, and it's putting uh, up huge research facilities in the United States, really growing strongly. IKEA is expanding, so, so there's lots of them, actually, but... Um, we are also trying to uh, invite as many uh, American companies to come to Sweden as possible. Uh, many of them have been in the UK, for instance, uh, but now that they have left uh, the EU, we are actually a good spot for American investments given, as I said, our technological level, but also that most of us speaks English. But the US is our fourth largest market. We are the 13th largest investor in the United States uh, and growing. So, uh, as Maria said, we're, uh, when it comes to population, we're like number 90 in the world. So, being the 13th largest investor here is huge. Uh, so, this is a very attractive market for, for Swedes. So, in all sectors, I would say. If, I don't know if you want to add. Any special sectors in technology? I mean, we are pushing uh, the green transition now. So, that's what we um, really... I mean, also... Defense, but uh, I would say that uh, the green transition is it's really a priority for the Swedish government for cooperation. Also, life sciences. Uh, I'm Jay Gore. I'm a professor in School of Mechanical Engineering, also a faculty member in the Maurice J. Zucro Laboratories, where the Saab Enterprise uh, is growing across the street. Uh, one of the uh, large recent projects I received was to help a traditionally coal-burning 1,300 megawatt power plant make transition uh, 
uh, while operating and not losing large number of jobs. And the exergy-based efficiency doubling, uh, as well as retraining of the workforce in the information technology areas in the, I will simply say the phrase, artificial intelligence uh, area, we have progressed. Uh, I have colleagues at Lund University who I interact with uh, in Sweden, but uh, could you comment on information technology and the advent of artificial intelligence and uh, more importantly, pathway to green while not losing jobs? Mm. Well, I think one of the things that we are very proud of in Sweden is how we have transformed our society uh, when it comes to, you know, we have all lost industries over the years. So for instance, Malmö used to be one of the biggest shipbuilding places in Sweden and, and also in, in Europe. I don't think they hardly build any ships anymore. Uh, so that society was transformed. We have a program uh, that uh, the Employers Association together with trade, we're very highly unionized country, 80% are unionized. Uh, but uh, so the Employers Association together with the trade unions have a program where uh, if, for instance, if you work at an industry that is is, is going out of date and not being replaced, they will actually uh, put you in a program where they will ask you, so w what is your dream job? And let's say you say florist, and there's a need of florist, they will retrain you. So within one year, 80% of the workers are actually in new careers. So for, I would say for 40, 50 years, we've had this kind of program uh, to, to shift people's uh, focus. And also, as I said, after the Cold War, we uh, not dismantled, but, uh, but made our military uh, force, our armed forces much smaller. So we had lots of military regiments, for instance, that had to close down. We have to retrain those who, uh, many officers actually became uh, teachers, uh, which they have been very successful. So we have, uh, we have uh, a long tradition of, of uh, transitioning workers from industries that are not, we don't save industries in Sweden, we save workers. So the government will never go in and, for instance, you remember Saab the car? <laughs> that had never got any help from the government to survive. Uh, but we retrain the workers. So, so that's how we do it. That's the business has to be sustainable in its own right, but then we will have to help the people uh, to transition into something else. But when it comes, comes to AI, that's of course a highly important uh, political uh, area where the politicians are now uh, I just read a paper yesterday trying to, to figure out how they should be able to coordinate their efforts better to support the development of, of AI technology in many sectors of both the public sector but also the private sector. Uh, I think the, the, our politicians are a bit, have been a bit late, <laughs> but industry is going for, forward. And I know the Wallenberg Foundation that was mentioned here are, are doing, uh, putting a lot of money into research, for instance, at the Swedish universities when it comes to AI. No, okay. So, hi, Jan Anders Manson. Today I'm primarily Swede, but I'm also a professor here at Purdue. Uh, I know you have a lot of great programs with great university around the world. Now we have a wave here we can ride, we can surf on with the SOP coming here. Do you have any good recommendation for how we can get more of these young people in exchange program with Sweden and Swedish universities? I think it. I think uh, as students you have to think a little bit out of the box. I think many don't think about Sweden as a country to go to because I guess many would like to go to Germany or, or France or the UK or, or Ireland or English speaking countries. But as I said, in Sweden, uh, as Maria said, lots of programs in English. We are, uh, as also been said, we have lots of universities that are world leading in many, many ways. So I think for you, if you decide to come, you would have an experience that you wouldn't have anywhere else. Our society is also very different, given the welfare system of Sweden. And actually, if you decide, I don't want to pull you away from Purdue, but you can get an engineering education in Sweden for half the price or one third of the price at a very good quality. So that's also interesting. 
So um, if you want to experience something totally different, uh, really do come. It's huge. Uh, we, uh, there are lots to experience, lots of uh, fun young, young people and, and good universities. But Maria can add. Yeah, I also want to add, now I'm looking at Miguel Andersson over there, uh, that the Swedish-American Chamber of Commerce is uh, putting an, um, a mobility program in place uh, for student exchange, but also for, for internship at companies. So it's a, it's a two-way uh, mobility program. So you can, I mean, if you, you uh, do your studies here, you can have your internship in Sweden and, and vice versa. And I think that's, uh, I mean, that's, that will be a, a very strong create a very strong bond between, between the US and, and Sweden. And also you can go to a bar when you're 18. <laughs> uh, good morning, thank you for those comments. I just wanted to add, and uh, you know, George is here, uh, but before the pandemic, uh, there were, uh, we had a significant increase in the number of students who were going to Sweden. I mean, we have partnerships, of course, in many universities, but including internships in Scania uh, and you know, many other universities study abroad. Uh, but we also had, interestingly, faculty who led, uh, faculty-led study abroad programs all the way to Kiruna. So you know, we read the news, see what's happening, and those of you who don't know about the, the Kiruna story, it's a pretty amazing story uh, as well. Uh, and uh, our faculty pivot and lead students to see what Sweden is doing. So just wanted to add, all that was going on well before the pandemic. And no, and Kiruna, yeah. Kiruna is really exotic. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. over the Arctic Circle. They have actually just moved the whole town because it was sitting on the big mine. Kiruna is a mining town, and, and they felt that they were worried that the city would actually sink because of the, all the, the hollowness underneath. So they moved the whole city. Uh, no, it's a fantastic experience. It's a fantastic town. And there's also the techni Technical University of Luleå, which is uh, really on the forefront of, of technology as well. So please do come. I think you would really enjoy it. <laughs>